We're here, excuse me just a minute. Why are you <laughs> The choir has been having a party up here, I'm telling you. Erin, what'd you give them before we got started? <laughs> Yesterday I was driving down White Bluff Drive and I saw two familiar cars one of them being the Night Steps and one of them being the Mitchells. And I thought, the poinsettias are coming. And so I pulled in and stopped and they were, they were putting lights in and poinsettias and, and working so hard. And this morning I said, oh man, those poinsettias look so good. I love the cross, the white cross that the white poinsettias make. And it was confessed that they went to Trace Hermanos and ate lunch and that Peggy made them come back and redo them because she didn't like the way they did them the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but they look beautiful, don't they? Thank you to the Night Steps. And <laughs> we have had such a fun season here with so many different um, activities. Friday night was fun with our Christmas celebration. We've got some things going on this week. In fact, we have so many that I said, Randy, now you don't mind if I take 20 or 25 minutes for the announcements. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me. So I took that as a no, but maybe, maybe not. Look in your bulletin on this inside insert where it says upcoming, and that QR code's down there. So if you forget, you can scan that with your phone camera, the camera on your phone, iPhone. But we tried to list those out. This Wednesday, the jazz band is coming from the high school. And we need some little finger foods because those kids love to eat after they play their instruments. And we're going to go to Fellowship Hall and have a little fellowship. So if you can help out, Mary's got a table in Fellowship Hall and you can sign up to bring uh, little finger foods. The same thing for Maurice Martin. You remember he's our founding uh, pastor when we started this church 20 years ago and his uh, memorial service funeral service will be this Friday and we're going to have a reception in the Friday afternoon after his uh, memorial service and so um, next week is our congregational meeting and then I want to point out that on Christmas Eve we're going to have two services one at 5 30 and one at seven o'clock and then only one service on Christmas Day and only one service on New Year's Day. So I just wanted to point those things out. And if you need to, stick that on your refrigerator so you don't forget it. We're so glad you're here. It's just such a special time. Christmas is always so special at White Bluff Chapel. And uh, we're so glad you're here. If you're visiting, welcome. And if you are a longtime member, we are welcome home. We're glad you're here this morning. So let's bow. Dear God, we just thank you for this chapel. We thank you for everybody that's in here, for the um, just all the volunteers that do so many things for us. God, we do all of this for the glory of your name and for the glory of Jesus Christ and that baby in the manger and the salvation that he brings us. God, thank you so much for everything. Bless this season. Be with those who are grieving, those who are ill, and um, those who just need your presence with them this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Today we light the third candle of Advent, and it's pink in color, and it symbolizes joy. It's also called the shepherd's candle. And it reminds us of the joy the world experienced at the birth of Christ. Today's reading is in Luke 1, 26 through 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great 
who he called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So this, um, this song we're about to sing, um, Mark Lowry wrote, Mary, did you know, back in, he wrote the words in 1984, um, and it was for a church program. He, he was filling in some gaps in the church program, and he, he got interested in it, and he started thinking, man, what questions would I ask him? Um, and he wrote the, he wrote the poem uh, over the next several years, and it wasn't until uh, he was in the Gaithers vocal band with Buddy Green that they collaborated and put some music together, you know, seven years later. And then, of course, Michael English recorded it. Uh, it has become a favorite. Um, you know, sung in churches and on TV and everywhere. Right? Um, but I always, you know, like Mark thought, wonder if I would ask Mary. I thought, how would Mary answer? Right? What would she say? You know, we have the magnificent, the, the, uh, the Mary's hymn in Luke, where, where she, she expresses her joy. Um, but how would she answer these questions? So I kind of put some words to this. And I sent Mark Lowry a note via his Facebook page, and he's never answered me back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I said, hey, hey Mark, I, I, I wrote some words. <laughs> if you're interested, I'll send them to you. Um, but, you know, Mary... New. I mean, this is, it, it, you know, the, the angel came to her and said, hey, there's going to be no end to his kingdom. Uh, you're going to have the son of God. In fact, when Abby and I started this, and, and I said, Abby, I said, you know, thank goodness Aaron brought her along because she does a wonderful job with her tonight. But I said, Abby, it, it's really appropriate that you're singing Mary's part because she was about your age. When, the Gabriel, when Gabriel came to her and said, hey, you're going to have the Son of God. Mary, and Abby said, I'd freak. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary kind of did too. Right? Um, but, but this is, okay, th this is my version of, of maybe how Mary would respond to this very, very, very beautiful song. Mary, did you know? <laughs> Did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you and this child that you deliver will soon deliver you. An angel said to me that my baby boy will walk in our God's favor. It was told to me that my baby boy will be our Lord and Savior. your baby boy would give sight to the blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that this baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you've kissed your little baby, you 
kiss the face of God. Everyone will see that my baby boy will do all sorts of wonders. Wonders they will see for this baby boy who ruled the storms and thunders. It will be to be that my baby boy will grow in strength and wisdom. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nation? Everyone will see that my baby boy has no end to his kingdom. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Abby. But, uh, what a great opening to our services that we've had this morning. I invite you now. Let's all join our voices together and sing some Christmas carols, starting with O Little Town of Bethlehem.
stand once again. Let's join our voices together and sing. What child is this? <laughs> just so blessed to be here together to worship you in this incredible chapel with friends and family at this most wonderful time of year. As we celebrate the, the Christmas season with gifts giving and gift giving and with lights and celebration, let's always remember that the true and most wonderful gift has been your son Jesus Christ is the gift and the light and the truth forever for all men and for all times. We pray these things in his precious name. Amen. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Amen. Thank you, Esther. Appreciate you reading that for us and just the, the purity of the voice and, and knowing and, and thinking about those words are the words of Mary to be able to express that joy and celebration that she had on that day. The words that are spoken there in Luke chapter 1 verses 46 through 45 are, are words of a song of joy and it's promised the light has shined 
Remember the last couple of weeks we've been talking about in, in Isaiah chapter 9 that the, the darkness is upon the world, that there is, there is doom and there is gloom and, and there is a promise that, that Isaiah says as he, he looks ahead, he said, there will be a day where the light will shine. And he says that light will be the one coming as a child that will be born among us. It'd be one that will give us life and, and light to the darkness. So between that prophecy of, of Isaiah until we come to the, the book of Matthew, there, there are 700 years. Now during those years, there, there are other prophecies and there are other um, individuals that speak of the coming of, of the Lord. And then in your, in your Bible, between that Old Testament book of Malachi and Matthew, and maybe that blank page that you have in there, there's a period of 400 years. 400 years, and it's known as the silent years. Now, there was a lot of activity during that time, and, and there were other things that were written. But when it came to prophecy and the fact that, that, that this light that was to come there is silence and there is wonder, will this Christ child, will this Messiah, the one that is promised, will he ever come? So we read in the gospel accounts of Matthew and Luke that tell of the, the birth of Christ. And we see particularly here in, in Luke chapter 1, and, and I invite you to turn to that. Luke chapter 1, it begins by talking about an, an angelic visitation to this priest, Zechariah, who is in the, the temple and the Holy of Holies, and he sees the, the presence of God, and there was a promise that even in his old age, and even in the old age of his wife, Elizabeth, that they themselves will see a miraculous birth. We, we read and continue in, 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 in the chapter that Mary then is visited by an angel with a life-changing announcement for her um, it's a world-changing announcement for all time. That's the verse that we, we read just a moment ago. He said, you are highly favored. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. After asking some clarifying questions, she finally nods, and in verse 38 says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then in verse 39 it says, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town to the hill country of Judea, where she entered into Zechariah's home. And as we continue reading there in verse 40, when she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is this child whom you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to see me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is he, is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. This passage reminds us of, of this, this young woman who just a, a, a few days prior had received this message. And, and as she has come to her, her cousin or her relative, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth that knew her as a child, she no longer sees her just as Mary, but she sees this, this young woman as the mother of my Lord. And, and, and there was, there was a, a leap in the womb of Elizabeth of who will become John the Baptist. And, and as he leaped for joy, there was a, a celebration. And Mary just soaking all of this in. <laughs> she comes to a point where she says the words that, that Esther just read a moment ago. Words of joy and, and perhaps a song. This, this phrase has... That, that, that has been used over time, it's been called the Magnificat. From the very first word, the Latin version of the text, and it holds a very important place in church history. For 2,000 years, the Magnificat has been sung by Christians all over the world. And, and one reason why I ask Esther to read the song is to capture it in full and to hear the words of Mary as it's proclaimed. And even as we read the scripture, we see, we hear bells and we can, we can celebrate 
and as if there's a calling that's coming to us and we can answer the call, so please answer the call. <laughs> like that yeah amen amen so the bells are still ringing this is good in the song we see that this young woman jewish woman did what most jewish women did in her day she memorized scripture in fact scholars have looked at this these words and they 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 reflect the words of hannah who was, was giving the, the good news that she would also bear a son uh, in, in, even in her old age. It shows words of the Psalms, and we see over and over that words that Mary probably heard in the synagogue, and those words that she heard um, through her own parents, and she is able to reflect upon that. And then we see in verse 46 that, that Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My soul glorifies the Lord. This is no casual song. These are no just random words that are being said. She is not giving lip service to God. The song of praise and joy and adoration is welling up into the depths of her being. She says, my, my soul, my spirit, from the very depth of my life, my soul magnifies the Lord. She's not saying that somehow God needs a greater magnification or being larger than he is, but rather that her soul has been saturated by the divine and by the presence and the mercy of God. From the, from the very depths of my soul and being, I want to exalt him. Words that that we can take as well, words that we can experience in our lives and, and to know that as we come to another Christmas season in, in Christmas 2022, that we can take the time to absorb what God is speaking to us. Years ago, my wife and I took our two elementary age children many, many years ago. We took a, a vacation out west, and um, we, we went, part of the vacation was to go to the Grand Canyon in northwestern Arizona. Now, I'd always seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, and had never actually been. Um, I knew it was grand, that's about all I knew, and it was a canyon. And so I, it was one of those where I thought, we'll go, we'll take a look at it, and then we'll look at the Hoover Dam, perhaps, and, and continue on our way. So we drove up and, and, and began to see some of the magnificence of that canyon. And we stopped and we looked, and, and all of us were just in awe. I mean, you can take a picture of the Grand Canyon. You can even take a panoramic picture. But there's nothing like being there and just seeing that that majesty all around you and seeing the joy of, of the celebration of, of, of the look of that Grand Canyon. Well, the only expression that I could do would be to say the words, wow. <laughs> now, I didn't really care at the time um, how old the Grand Canyon was. There's Theological questions about that. It could be millions of years old. It could be thousands. It could be hundreds. <laughs> I didn't really think about the, the, the different types of sedimentary rocks that were in the different layers that were there. That wasn't my focus. I, my focus was simply to stand in the presence of that canyon and just simply to say, now, now, later, I would talk with the park ranger, and we'd talk about details, and th those were things that were interesting to know. But the most important thing was to be part of the experience. You see, there are some, well, let me just say all scripture, but some in particular, it's almost like they're, they're Grand Canyon moments. And if we're not careful as teachers and theologians and worshipers, if we're not careful, we can 
find ourselves beginning to dissect the scripture and beginning to, 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 to look at with our investigative minds the how and the what and the when and the why and the where and we can, we can look at it in depth and we can, we can dig deep and we can think about all the implications of what's taking place and we can do all that, but if we're not careful, we can miss the immensity of the picture. We can miss the, the, the magnificence of the moment. We can miss somehow that, that we are, 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 are doing church and we are checking all the boxes of the Christmas season, and yet if we don't step back and wonder and awe, we have missed the moment. So part of the Advent season, I, I think, is encouraging us to tap the brakes a little bit, to be able to take a breath and a pause, and to be able to, at times, in the busyness of the season, to truly to capture the moment, to be able to come before the Lord and say, Lord, we, we praise you. And just as Mary praised you for what you had done and what you are doing in her life, Lord, we, we desire to stop and to, to praise you and to honor you for all that you are. As we take time to reflect upon him, there are some, some words that come up that, that help us to continue to capture the moment. One of those words that we see in the song is the word humble. God has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant, the humble, lowly estate. If you were to list all the ways in, which the, in the ancient world where you could be of low estate, Mary checked almost all of them in the first century. She was poor. She was young. She was unmarried, and she was a woman. There is no false humility about her. Notice in the song, she never mentions that she is the one that's going to give birth to the Son of God. In, in, in the passage, there's no um, bragging hashtag going to be the mother of the Messiah. <laughs> she would have never posted this on social media. She would have never live streamed the, the event. Rather, in a true, humble spirit, she simply is walking in joyful obedience. We see throughout this song that there is humility that comes from her. The second word that we see that I just highlight is the word blessed. She says, for we have been mindful of the humble estate of his servant, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Though she is humble, she recognizes that, that she will be called blessed. And the reason that she is blessed is because not so much of who she is and what she has done, but rather that she has been chosen to be the mother of Jesus. Now, obviously, there's only one person that can ever hold this honor. But we should always remember that we are blessed as well. The scriptures that say, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And Jesus using the same word in the Beatitudes, including blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart. We hear the words today. I, I, I greeted somebody this morning and I asked, how are you doing? And, and the, question, the answer was, I'm blessed. I've heard others say, I'm blessed beyond measure. I'm blessed beyond words. I'm blessed beyond belief. I am blessed and, and highly favored. <laughs> a recognition of the fact that we are blessed is an important recognition. But we have to be careful that, again, just like in the words of, of Mary, that we don't just say it lip service. We don't just say it as if something we're supposed to say, but that in the very depth of our soul, that we say, I am blessed. God has blessed me in so many ways. There are so many ways in which God continues to bless. We, we remember that we are blessed not only when things are going well, but when life is difficult, 
Remember, Mary was in a difficult situation. She knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that in that quietness of her room that an angel had appeared to her and had said to her, you will bear a son, and the son will come by the Holy Spirit. Mary knew that that in this visit to Elizabeth, her relative, that it was confirmed that there is that, that no doubt recognition that she is the mother of the Messiah and she will be. But remember that Mary also had to go back home. Also, also had to go back home and after staying with Elizabeth for about three months, she would be returning home and with a child in her womb beginning to show. And there would be doubts about her story. There would be doubts if, if she were to say, this truly is a, the, the, I will be the mother of the Messiah. I have been, I, I have come and I, God has blessed me to provide this for me. There will be doubts, there will be stares. She knew all these things, but she knew she was following the Lord's will. And she knew that in the words of Elizabeth, that blessed is she who has come and believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. So in the the big majestic look that we see in our passage, and then to look at some of those areas of, 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 of humble and blessed, and then there's an interesting word that we see in verse 53 of hungry. In verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things but he has sent the rich away empty. Now, we all know what it means to be hungry. Most of us have never had an extended hunger, a sustained hunger of days or or weeks. Physical hunger is a basic need, and we need to be aware of those around us that are hungry and to be able to provide for them. But the passage goes beyond this. It goes beyond just your love for steak and potatoes and enchiladas and, and turkey and dressing and all the desserts that we get this time of the year. And, and by the way, thank you, ladies, for all the desserts we get this time of the year. <laughs> We've had some parties and Christmas parties and choir parties and this past weekend with Christmas celebration, all those things. And it's just um, amazing that, that the amount of food, not only that, that is there, but that we consume. And, of course, being a good pastor, I, I, I try all of them because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Yes, that's just the servant in me, yes. But we know what hunger is, but, but there are different ways of hunger. You see, we can also hunger not only to fill our bellies, but we can hun- hunger after righteousness, or we can hunger at, for a relationship. We can hunger for financial gain or for success or prestige or honor or respect. There's all sorts of hunger, but the greatest hunger we can have is to say, Lord, more than anything, we desire to hunger after you. Just as our stomachs remind us when we are hungry, and again, it could be for missing one meal or two, or think of a series of meals, and you just we, we want to, to satisfy the hunger. The scripture is very clear that the only satisfaction of hunger is, is the, the spiritual food that our Lord and Savior provides us. It's the only, only food that, that truly satisfies our lives. We can hunger after a lot of things. We can hunger and, and say these are the things that are important and, and I want to pursue them. But unless we also and begin with the hunger of righteousness, the hunger of our God, then we will never be fulfilled. We will never have that true satisfaction. In our story, in in our passage, we see that in a few short months, Mary and Joseph will travel to the little town of Bethlehem where Jesus will be born. The promise will be fulfilled. You may know that the word Jesus means Savior. You may not know that that Bethlehem also is significant. Bethlehem made of two words of Beth, the house, and Lahem, a bread. You see, Scripture says that Jesus, the, the Savior, is born 
in the house of bread. Jesus, the Savior, is the bread of life. Jesus, the the Savior, is the one who satisfies our deepest needs. That's what the story is about. (laughs) And and we can can glean the words of humility and, and know that it's through our humility that we come to Christ. We know that the word blessed that we, we can be blessed because of what Christ has done and continues to do in our lives. We can think of the word hungry because it's that, that hunger that we have that, that, that truly is satisfied only by the presence of Christ. And we can, we can come, and as we do all that too, to be mindful of the vastness of the expanse of the grace and the mercy of our God. Earlier in the service, we, we heard the song, Mary, Did You Know? As Tom said, it was written by Mark Lowry. And um, one quote that he said, I, I just tried to put into words the unfathomable. Think about that. <laughs> I tried to put into the words of the un- unfathomable. I started thinking of the questions I would a- have for Mary if I were to sit down and have coffee with her. series of questions of Mary, did you know? Did you know your baby boy would, would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? The child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Now, we don't know exactly with all that Mary knew. She kind of knew the basics, but, but again, did she know of, of the cross? Did she know of the crucifixion? Did, did she know of the resurrection? Did she know of the ascension where, where she was present with, with all of those things? But she knew this, is that just as she, as the song says, kissed the little boy that she kissed, the face of God. She knew that. She knew we see in the song, Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices not only in my baby, my spirit rejoices in what you've done, but she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You see, Mary knew that that Jesus is her child, but she also knew that Jesus is God. <clears throat> she knew that Jesus was her Savior. And I, and I guess the realization today for us all to know that in the majesty of the moment that he has also come to make us new, for you and and for me, to renew us, to restore us, to reclaim us, to redeem us. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what situation of life that you are in, that each of us have the opportunity to embrace the richness and the fullness of our God. That that the Savior that we speak of and and, and the child that we sing of, that, that Jesus, our Savior, is the one who will redeem us. He will be the one who allows us in our humble state as we come before him humbly to be blessed and to fulfill the greatest hunger of our lives. We have come before the Lord. May we always join with Mary who says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. invite you to bow your heads as we have a time of reflection upon these words. Much has been said this morning with our our songs and the the powerful words in those songs, but the scriptures that we've read, the challenge, a reminder that that Jesus is, is our Savior. He is our Lord. Have we come to that point to receive him for our own? Have we said, just as Mary did when she had the opportunity to accept or reject the challenge to become the mother of Christ. Can we also be one to say yes? Yes, Lord.
We'll begin our congregational singing this morning with the first two verses of a little town of Bethlehem. And today we're going to close our service by singing the third verse. If you would, let's stand together and sing third verse, a little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> week. Don't forget also the Christmas concert right here Wednesday at 6 o'clock with the high school jazz band from Whitney. We'd love to have you come out and be a part of that. Have a blessed week.